When you see someone troubled, what do you do? When you see someone in need, what do you do? The other day, just yesterday, I was driving and we were stopped at a corner. I wasn't at the corner. I was the car behind the truck that was stopped at the corner. On that corner, there was a man begging. A man had a sign. I'm not sure what it said, but stating that he needed money. Either he was hungry or he had to feed his family. And so he was troubled. He was in need. And so as the light turned green, the truck in front of me took off. But as it took off, it the gentleman opened up his car door and just threw $3 out on the ground. The man that was troubled needed that money. And so instead of getting money in his hand, which is the proper thing to do, which is the right thing to do, he had to scamper on the ground to get the $3 bills that was just thrown at him. That man was troubled. I don't think he was ministered in the right way. I think when people are troubled, they're supposed to be comforted. They're supposed to be left better because of you. And because of what I saw, I was troubled. It bothered me. I had never seen that before. Just throwing the money out the door into the street. And the man has to scamper to get the money because he needs it so bad. It bothered me. It troubled me. Well, in our lesson today, we're going to see how Jesus Christ comfort those who are troubled. How he can comfort somebody who is begging because they need something. And how he can comfort someone who in this world saw something that wasn't right and it troubled him. Welcome to the Sunday School Lesson with Reverend Dr. John W. Wilson III. Hello everyone, welcome to the Sunday School Lesson with Reverend Dr. John W. Wilson III. Thank you for joining me today. We have a great, exciting lesson today, one passage that we're familiar with, but oftentimes uh, the passage that we're familiar with, there's a lot of water left in the well. And so that's what we're going to try to do, take a different look at a passage that we're familiar with. Our passage is John 14, 1 through 14, and the lesson is titled Wisdom to Follow, Wisdom to Follow, John 14, 1 through 14, familiar passage. We're going we're gonna to learn something new today. Before we get started, uh, let's, I want to remind you if this lesson is beneficial to you or if you know someone who may benefit from this lesson, please hit the like button. Please share this button. If you're on YouTube, please hit the subscribe button. Leave something in the comment section. Uh, I would like to hear from you. I would like this to reach as many people as possible. So thank you so much. So let's get into this exciting lesson. All right. So we're in John chapter 14. Let me give you the setting. Let me paint the setting for you. It's, it's Jesus and the 12 disciples. They're into their, around the end of their three years of Jesus's ministry. In other words, there's just hours away from Jesus dying on the cross. For the first three years, been pretty smooth um, for the disciples and Jesus. Not much uh, adversity, uh, not much hard times, but it's getting ready to switch. And Jesus, toward the end of these three years, has been telling the disciples that he's going to have to go somewhere. He's going to have to leave them. And so uh, he has to... He's been prepping them for them, but they have not been absorbing that. And so a lot of things have happened, uh, especially uh, in chapter 13, that brings tension into this passage. Uh, one, you have Jesus watching the disciples' feet. Uh, Peter says no. Jesus has to convince them that, hey, 
Uh, if you want to be with me, I think you need to make this happen. Uh, then he goes on to tell them that one of them will betray them. And at this time, Judas eats of that morsel. Jesus excuses him from the table. Jesus goes into night to meet with the Roman uh, author the Jewish authorities and the Roman authorities there too. So right now there's 11 disciples. Uh, and now uh, Jesus says, one of you guys is going to betray me. They're thinking who is going to be. They don't realize that it's Judas. And so now it's kind of anxiety there. And then um, Peter uh, goes to him and says, uh, Lord, uh, Jesus tells them in uh, chapter 13, verse 36, he goes, where I go, you cannot go. And so Peter's upset with that. He says, I will go with you. I will follow you and I will lay down my life with you. And then Jesus goes on to tell them that, uh, before the rooster crows, you would have denied him three times. So Jesus has told them that uh, I'm only going to be with you for a little while in the chapter 13. You will seek me and just as I said to the Jews. So now I must also, also say to you where I'm going, you cannot go. So Jesus is saying, I'm about to leave you. I'm about to depart. Uh, I'm about to, our three year relationship is about to break. And so uh where I go, you can't go. You cannot go. You cannot follow me. And that brings a lot of anxiety and uncertainty into the equation because um, Jesus is really talking about his death and they get that. And so the issue is uh, they're troubled. OK, I've been with Jesus for three years. He's been my rabbi. He's been my teacher. He's been my spiritual leader. What am I going to do when he's gone? How am I able to survive What's going to happen left? What's next in my life? I've sacrificed everything. I've given up my family. I've given up money, occupation, all those things. I've invested time in there. So what is going to happen to me or what I'm going to do when Jesus is not around? I love him. I have a relationship with him. Uh, I, I, enjoy the last, I enjoyed the last three years. I wish it could go on forever. And Jesus says it can't. So what I'm going to do, their future is uncertain. And the other thing in the back of their mind, it says, Jesus, you are a king. You're going to deliver us from Israel. If you're going to die or you're going to leave us, what happens to that? And so their hearts are troubled. Their hearts are heavy because what was good for three years is coming to an end. And now Jesus, it seems as though he's abandoning them or he's, he's breaking off that relationship. And now they'll be on their own. And now they don't know what their future holds. They don't even know what to do. They don't even know how they're going to make it. They feel ill-prepared to go on and do what Jesus has told them to do. So that's going to lead us into chapter 14. That's the mindset. That's the thinking that's going on. I mean, if you ever lost a loved one and you uh, maybe a husband, a spouse, a mother, father, sister, best friend, and you wonder how I'm going to make it without them. That's what they're thinking right now. And so the first thing Jesus says, recognizing that after he tells Peter that he's going to deny him three times, he says, let not your hearts be troubled. In other words, he makes an imperative, a command. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Uh, do not grieve. Do not have this anxiety. He says, and he gives them the reason why he says, uh, believe in me. Well, believe in God, believe also in me. He said that word believe can also mean trust. Let not your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Have faith in God. Believe in God and believe also in me. Trust in me. Believe in me and have faith in me. So here immediately Jesus says, do not be troubled. He puts himself and God on the same level playing field. He's letting them know indirectly. And he'll get more specific that he and the father are one. If you've seen me, you've seen the father. So he says, believe in me, believe also in me. He wants them to trust in God and then trust in me because things are going to be okay. They may look bad now. You may be troubled or you may be having a lot of anxiety, but if you trust in me and trust in God, believe in me, believe in God, things will get better. And that's a message for many people today in our COVID-19 situation high unemployment, a bad economic times. We're trying to rebound, but a lot of people, hearts are troubled 
and they don't know what their future is going to be like. Things were going good, but now they've turned to a different direction. Things are flat. Things are sorrowful. Things are uncertain. And God's message is still the same. Believe in God and believe also in me. That's the first step. Make sure and when you're troubled, you know who to go to. You know who to put your faith and trust to. You don't want to put it in politics. You don't want to put it in the president. You don't want to put it in the vice president. You don't want to put it in the Senate majority leader. You don't want to put it in the House majority, majority leader. You don't want to even put it in your mayor or your local judge. No, put it squarely on God's shoulder and the Father's shoulder. That's the first step when your heart is troubled and you're, and you're doubtful about what's going to happen in the future. So that's a lesson learned there. He says here, and he gives a reason why. Why should you believe in God? Why should you believe in me? And so God, uh, Jesus points to a future time, uh, into the future where things are going to be better. He says, in my, the reason why you ought to believe in me is that in my father's house are many rooms. In my father's house are many rooms. That's why you should be not troubled. And so this is a metaphor. Jesus is trying to take a spiritual truth and put it in terms in which the disciples, the 11 disciples can truly understand. Uh, in my father's house, that means where my father of, abides. That means where my father, his domain is. is my father is where heaven is. So in my father's house, in heaven, where my father of, uh, abides, uh, where he dwells are many rooms. Okay. Uh, there are there literally rooms, probably not, but it's the there, but there are many places in heaven. Uh, we will, uh, when we go to heaven, uh, we will be in the spiritual sense first. So there'll be no need for rooms. Uh, even in the, when Jesus comes back for the second time and we'll have our resurrected bodies, we will still not need rooms. We will no longer sleep. We will not have to eat, even though we may eat, we will not have to sleep. We don't have the necessities of a dwelling like we do here. But this is a metaphor that Jesus is using to, to comfort the, the 11 disciples and to paint a picture of how great it's going to be in heaven dwelling with God. So in my house, there are many rooms, okay? In, my, in heaven, there are many places, there are many dwelling places. He said, if it were not so, I would have told you that I go and prepare a place for you. He said, if I, if it were not so, would I have told you that I go prepare a place for you? Jesus says, look, I'm telling you that I'm going to prepare a place for you. If this was not true, I wouldn't have said that. I wouldn't have said that. And he goes here. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself that where I am, you may be also. Look what he says here. I go to prepare a place for you. What Jesus is saying is that when I leave here, I am going to prepare a place for you. For you. Okay, when Jesus dies, he's going to hang on a cross. He's going to be resurrected. He's going to ascend into heaven. But when he sends into heaven, he's going to leave a helper. And, 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 and while he's leaving a helper, he's preparing a place for us. In other words, he is taking, making the way for us, you and me, those who believe, a place in heaven. And the way he does that is through his death on the cross, his burial, his resurrection, the important, the leaving of the Holy Spirit and him ascending into heaven. And those who believe will be empowered with the, with the Holy Spirit. And then when we die or when Christ comes for us, we go to heaven. And that's the place that Jesus has prepared for us. So he's talking about something from an eternal perspective. He says, and if I go prepare a place for you and I will, that's what he really says. If I prepare heaven for you, if I make a way for you to go to heaven, Guess what? I will come again and will take you to myself. Meaning what Jesus is saying here is that I prepare a place for you in heaven. And then I will come to you 
to myself. I will be with you. I will come get you when you die or when that time is and where I am, you will be also with me. Right now, you think that uh, I'm leaving you and that's a permanent thing. What Jesus is saying here in the big scheme of things, the time that I'm away from you is a temporary thing. It's temporary because after I've made this way for you, after I got this place for you, when I die, I'm going to come back at some time. And when I come back, I'm going to bring you to myself. You're going to be with me so that no matter where I am, you will always be with me. That relationship that we had before does not end by me going away. And you will, uh, when I come back, we will be reunited and we will be close. If probably we will be even closer than we were before. Our relationship will be even better than it was before. I'm going to bring you to myself and you will always be with me for an eternity in heaven. That's comforting words. How can your heart be troubled when Christ says, I, uh, yes, I'm going, but I'm coming back to get you. I got a nice place prepared for you. And when I bring you to that place, guess what's going to happen? You're going to be with me. I'm going to bring you to myself and we're going to always abide together, live together forever and ever. And nothing can set us, tear us apart. Amazing. What words? I like that. No matter what we're going through, if you believe in Christ, our future is better because our future is in Christ. Just remember that. Okay. He says here. I will come again I will, and I will take you to myself where I am. You may be also. And you know the way to where I am going. And you know the way. What's the way? The way is going to God. And you know the way to go to God. And where I am going. Okay. So here we got this right here. Jesus is assuming that they know the way to go to God. They know how to be reconciled with God. They know how to be reunited with God and where I am going. So you know where I'm going and you know the way. Okay. I am, I am going to heaven by way of the cross, by way of the resurrection, by the way of the ascension. I'm going to heaven to be with my father and you know that way. Then Thomas says to him, Lord, we do not know where you're going. He thinks that there, this, this, uh, this, uh, in my, uh, house or uh, in this heaven, the many room, he thinks there's a destination. There's a, there's a roadmap to get there. That's not what Jesus is saying. There's something that he has to do or has to follow to get there. What Jesus is saying is he's really saying it's a relationship your relationship with God is what's uh, through Jesus. It would allow you to access the father's house and those many dwelling places. So Thomas says, Lord, we do not know where you're going. How can we know the way? Meaning that we don't know where you're going. So how do we know how to get to God? And Jesus says to him in response, look, relationship. I am the way. I am the way to God. I am the way to God. That's what he's saying. I am the way. I am the way and the truth and the life. And what he's saying here, uh, if you know the truth, if you know the life, you know the way. The truth is knowing that God is the truth. The truth is knowing that Jesus is the way. The life is the eternal life that God promises. So if you know the truth that Jesus is the way, that, that Jesus is God, and you know that Jesus is the life, that he brings eternal life, then you know the way, which is believing in Jesus. The way to God is believing in Jesus. The way to God is trusting in Jesus. The way to God is uh, allowing Jesus or accepting Jesus into your heart and allow him to atone for your sins. If you know that, then you know the truth and you know the life. Because the truth and the life brings you back to the way. It says here, no one comes to the father except through me. 
I love this. Christianity is, is it exclusive. It's not inclusive. In other words, it rules out any other belief system, any other religion, any other faith that says there's another way to God, to heaven, uh, except for Jesus. And what Jesus is saying here is that Jesus is the only way and no one is saved without him. Acts 4.12. And so here it says, no one comes to the Father except through me. Meaning that in order to access the Father, you have to have a relationship with his Son. If you have a relationship with his Son, then you are reconciled to the Father. If you have a relationship with Jesus, then you have access to the Father's house and his many dwelling places. Jesus is building a case of tying him and the Father together that they're inseparable. You can't believe in one without the other. He said, if you had known me, you would have known the Father also. In other words, by Thomas answering that, answering that question, not knowing the way, or not knowing where he's going, he, he's letting Jesus, and Thomas is really speaking for the other disciples too, so don't think that it's just him thinking that way because everybody else is silent, and usually when somebody is silent and they let somebody speak for him, they agree with that what that person is saying. No one is trying to tell him not to say anything. And so what he's saying, what Jesus is saying here is that you, didn't, you don't know me the way that you should. You may know me as Jesus, as your rabbi, as your teacher, as your spiritual advisor. You may know me as your mentor and you as my disciple, but you don't, you don't begin to know all of who I am. I am the son of God. I am the Savior that's come to redeem the world. And so if you had known me as Savior, if you had known me who I really am in a significant way as a son of God, as God himself walking here on earth, then you would have known the father. But because you didn't know me in that way, in that significant way, you missed out on that. And he goes right here because he says right here, if you would have known me, you would have known the father. If you really would have known who I am, you would have known the father in heaven. From now on, you do know him and you have seen him. Now he's, he's building his case and saying, I and the father is one. If you see me, you see the father. So from now on, based on what I just said, you do know him because you know me and you have seen him because you have seen me. Because if you see me, you've seen the father. I am the revelation of the father. I, I'm not the manifestation because we are different people, but we have the same nature and the same essence. So in, in reality, if you've seen me, you've seen the father. If you've known me, you've known the father. Philip says, Philip, now it's his turn to talk. And I love this because now we get to really hear Thomas and Philip's talk, Philip talk, and we really don't hear them a lot in scripture. So it's just good to, to hear that. Philip says to him, Lord, show us the father and it's enough for us. Philip and the other disciples are struggling with what Jesus just said. They don't grasp that they are looking at the father right now. What Philip is saying, father, show me proof, the same kind of proof that Moses asked for. When Moses asked for that, he wanted to see God and God showed him a glimpse of his glory on the backside. And then Isaiah in his vision saw uh, God on his throne. And so Philip's saying, if you just show me who God is, I'll believe everything that you have to say. Show us the father. That's enough. So it's showing us by Philip is saying that it's really showing that his ignorance still, he's still not comprehending. And don't get mad at Thomas and Philip and the rest of the disciples, because if we were in that same situation and Jesus was somebody who's claiming to be father, no matter how much we love and care, it would be difficult to believe, hard to believe because it had never happened before. It, it's beyond our imagination. It's, uh, uh, they loved Jesus, but they were looking for somebody on a horse and a knight in shining honor and somebody who's going to overthrow the Roman because he didn't, he didn't fit the bill. So don't take it out on them. We would have thought the exact same way and said the exact same thing. 
In fact, many of them, only, remember, we wouldn't have probably even been chosen to be his disciples. So don't take it hard on them. Jesus gives a little rebuke and Jesus says to him, have I been with you so long? I've been with you for the past three years and you still don't know me, Philip? The same thing he really said to Thomas. You don't know me in a way that I am the father. You don't know me in a way that if you've seen me, you've seen the father and I'm the, the a revelation of the father. That he and I have the same attributes, the same nature, the same essence. Look what he said. Now he's clearer. Whoever has seen me has seen the father. He's saying, I am the exact revelation of God the Father. I am not God the Father, but I'm the exact revelation of him. I'm not monotheistic, meaning that I'm not the revelation of the Father. I mean, I'm not, the, I'm not God manifesting himself in the human form. No, I'm a separate person. God's a separate person, but we have the same essence, the same nature. So much so, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. How can you say, show me the Father? He said, how can you say that when I'm right here and you've been with me so long? You've seen what I've done. You've seen what I've said. How can you say that? You, how can you, you miss the big picture? So he kind of rebukes him, but he does it in a loving way. Does it in a way that he's, they're, they're, he's educating him. He's teaching him. All the rest of the disciples too. Verse 10 says, do you not believe that I am in the father and the father is in me? Do you not know that the, I dwell in the father and the father dwells in me? That we're one and the same? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority. All this teaching that, that I've done, all these words I'm saying right now, I'm able to say that because the father dwells inside of me and I speak on his authority. But the father who dwells in me. Does. Me. Dwells in me. Does his works. In other words. Not only do my, are my words from the father. But my works are from the father. Because my father dwells in me. He says believe me that. I am in the father. And the father is in me. Or else. Believe on the account of the works themselves, the miracles that Jesus performed. Miracles are a sign that point to something. They're not just done just because of the miracle's sake. Jesus done his miracles to attest to the fact, one, he wanted to bless the individual too, one, but he done it to attest to the fact or to give a sign that he was the Messiah, that he was the sent one that he was the son of God, that he was an agent of God, that he was a, a revelation of God. He says, believe on the account of the works themselves. And, and, and the issue is that uh, the, the raising of Lazarus, the healings that took place, all of those things, they pointed to who he was. Verse 12, truly, truly, I say to you, Whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do and greater works than these will he do because I'm going to the father. Let's back this up because I'm going to the father. Truly, truly means listen, listen, listen for real. What I say is true. What I'm saying will happen. That whoever believes in me because I am going to be with the Father uh, will do greater works than these that, I, that will do greater works than these will he do. What he's saying is that because you believe in me, because I am going away, you will do greater works than I. How is that possible? How, what's more possible than raising Lazarus from the dead? What's more possible than raising Jairus' daughter from the dead? What's more possible is returning a, a withered hand back to normal? How can we outdo feeding the 5,000? How can we do that? And what the greater works that we're talking about are really spiritual works. 
Do you know the Pentecost in which G, uh, Peter preached that sermon in Acts? You know, 3,000 people were saved. And so what we're really talking about, the greater works, and, and the greater works than the physical work, the physical works are important, but the greater works than physical works are the spiritual works, meaning conversions. Meaning that because I am going away, and when I go away, I am leaving the Holy Spirit with you that will dwell in you. That's why you must go away. When I'm no longer here, you and countless others will do greater works in number and do greater works, period, because a spiritual conversion is greater than a physical healing. A spiritual work is greater than a physical work. And because you'll be doing spiritual works, more so than you will be doing physical works. And really, in reality, as you do more spiritual works, the physical works will need to go away because there no longer needs to be a sign. The sign itself will be the spiritual work itself. Those works will be greater. They'll be greater in number, but they'll be greater in significance, in magnitude. Someone getting saved, what can be better than that? What can be higher than that? What can be greater? Because that person who's saved now has eternal life, has their sins forgiven, are reconciled back to God, and now their destiny is to cure. That's why I, I firmly believe that, 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 that leading someone to Christ is what God has called us to do. That's what the Bible says. There's nothing more important than that. Yes, we are to feed the hungry. Yes, we are to help out the sick. Yes, we are to minister the orphan and the widow. Yes, we are. But the greatest thing, and it's not an either or, but the greatest thing that we can do is lead someone to Christ. Because that, because instead of taking a, a care of an immediate need or a temporal need, you're taking care of God is using you to take care of a, a spiritual need, an eternal need. So it says, whatever you ask in my name, this is the context, it's prayer. The context is doing the greater work uh, than Christ, doing the great work for Christ. Uh, uh, that's the context. So it's not whatever you ask, anything you ask. It's whatever you ask in my name to do my father's will, to further his kingdom, to further conversions to minister to his people. He says, whatever you ask in my name, this I will do that the father may be glorified in the son. So whatever you ask, the father will do. Whatever you ask to bring about more conversion to meet the spiritual needs of the people, I will do. And I will do it because the father will be glorified. In other words, when people come to Christ, the, the, the father, the son is in, the Holy Spirit is there. The son is involved and the father is glorified. And look what he says at the end. If you ask me, in other words, when we pray, we can pray to God or we can pray to Jesus. And Jesus is reemphasizing the point that him and the father are one. Uh, Jesus is a revelation of the father. Not the same, but a revelation. So you can pray to God. Or you can pray to Jesus and Jesus says, ask in my name. And when you ask in my name, you know what that means? You're asking according to the will of Jesus. You're asking for something that Jesus himself would want you to pray for. And many times that's why our prayers are not answered. Because we think we're asking in Jesus name, but we're not asking according to Jesus's will. Big difference. Okay. And Jesus says, I will do it. Amazing. If you want your prayers answered, line your prayers up with God's will, with Jesus's will, and pray in Jesus's will. And Jesus says, watch me get to work and watch God's name will be glorified. If what I'm asking for in prayer, will it glorify God? Will it be, a, will it, pass, will it uh, be in the will of Jesus? Does it pass those tests? Is the Holy Spirit leading me in this prayer. So what do we learn today? Then don't let your hearts be troubled no matter how bad it gets here on earth. 
No matter how bad it is, Jesus got a better place prepared for us. He has paved the way through the death, burial, and resurrection. He has paved the way. All he wants us to do is the time that we have here is to preach the gospel, be an evangelist, build his kingdom, do his will, do greater works, do spiritual works. That's all he wants. Take care of business. And if we're focused on God's will, doing his will, and edifying the kingdom, no matter what we're going through, our hearts will not be troubled because guess what? They'll no longer be focused on the situation that we're in. They'll be focused on doing God's work. And that's what happened. Isn't God a great confidence? Isn't God know, knows exactly what we need? Boy, I, I feel much better by teaching this lesson. I, my, I was troubled yesterday, but I am at peace today. My heart is no more in trouble because God, Jesus has a plan. He's already worked that plan out. And that plan will come to fruition. All I have to do is believe. All I have to do is obey. All I have to do is, is line my, my life up with his. Because the Bible says Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. So no matter what you're going through, trust God. It says believe in God. Believe in him. And that will take a weight off your shoulders and pray according to his will. Well, God bless you. I love you so much. Thank you for your time. Uh, I hope this lesson has been beneficial to you. Remember, hit the like button, the share button, the subscribe button. Uh, go out there and share the work gospel. Line your prayers up with Jesus. Pray in his name. Build that community and watch what God will do. Take care. I'll see you Sunday. Have a great Sunday.